welcome, first of all, guys, to the Grio Trio, the art of storytelling and how to profit from it. Uh, I am here with uh, none other than Sydney James and Jamon Jordan, two of my personal favorite storytellers, people that I've admired from afar. Um, and I've, you know, I've interviewed Sydney, and I've, I've had the uh, the opportunity to recently interview Jamon, and I actually kind of uh, wrote this session in without ever speaking to them about it. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just thankful that they agree and that they're participating in this. And I think we can, uh, you know, that our, our participants can gain a lot of, of value from, uh, from us three. Um, so uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to, let's start with Jamon and just kind of a backstory on who you are, what you do, um, and then we'll, we'll go with Sydney. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I can't see everybody, but I know they're there. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jamon Jordan. I am the historian and tour leader for Black Scroll Network History and Tours. I lead tours and lectures and presentations about Detroit's Black history. So I lead tours in and around the city of Detroit, and I give lectures about Detroit's Black history. And we'll talk about some of what I do before the session is over. And I'm Sydney G. James. I'm a visual artist, um, illustration, fine art muralist painter, um, muralist as the last five years. Um, I have many walls around the city of Detroit. I am homegrown straight out of the Conant Gardens area, historical Conant Gardens area. Um, and Jamon Jordan will tell you more about that once right. we get the discussion going. Right. Right. And I have uh, other murals around the world, around the globe. So mm -hmm. yes. that's what I am. Wow. And then just, uh, I guess, a little bit of what, about who I am and what I do. My name is Cartier Madlock. Uh, I call that's his real name, name, everybody. The real name. <laughs> and, and funny fact, my middle name is Jamon. Wow. You did really? Know. Right. What? It actually is, yeah. What? So, <laughs> they the exact That's same. dope. Big things, big things. Exactly. So it's meant to be. Um, yeah, that's dope. I call myself a visual storyteller for Black artists and entrepreneurs within the city of Detroit. Uh, my business idea, uh, my business is Black Business Finder. I wanted it to be a cell phone app to locate Black-owned businesses. It will vibrate when you were within a certain vicinity. Uh, I wanted, when you open the app, it to be a woman interview of each uh, entrepreneur, you know, so you would see the business owner rather than just whatever, uh, good cakes and bakes or whatever, right? So, right. Um, and I just started filming people. I tried to be proactive and say, okay, well, let's film the interview piece because I can get a cheap camera and, and kind of make it do what he do. Uh, and then I just got good at editing and the rest is history. So uh, again, uh, welcome guys. So we're going to talk a little bit about storytelling uh, and, and how we tell our stories through our, our kind of certain mediums uh, that we practice. Um, and, 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 you know, so I guess, Jamon, I can ask you, I know you do your tours through Black Scroll Network, um, and that's your company. Uh, so what would, what would you say, can, can you talk about maybe a most memorable tour that, that you've had or one that has had the most impact on you? So I've had a lot of them. I've had a lot of really uh, memorable tours. Um, in one case, it was, I had a member, uh, it was a very memorable tour because there were, we had two busloads of people. So, um, uh, I'm on one bus and then we have another bus. So we're going to site to site and we're unloading, you know, over a hundred people at these sites. Um, so as we're moving about the city and going to these different places and you got over a hundred people showing up at a site. Uh, of course, it becomes, uh, you know, people like, you know, who are, what are y'all doing? Who are y'all? So um, that was one of the tours that people who had never heard of me or didn't know what I was doing, a lot of them found out about me uh, through that tour uh, as I'm bringing uh, two, 255 passenger busloads of people uh, on a tour. So that was memorable, memorable. But uh, what 
is what happens on a lot of tours that makes a lot of tours memorable are people who are from the city of Detroit who go to a site that they live right next to and they never knew that this event or this person's history was right there where they grew up, where they lived their whole life. That is one of the most, you know, really impactful things that I think uh, I'm blessed to be able to do is that people, of course, people come from far away, go to these sites and have never heard of them. But there are people who live right next to a site or grew up um, in that neighborhood and they learn something that they never knew before. And so I'm happy to be able to ground people in Detroit's history because so many people have grown up in the city of Detroit, but this history has been missing and hidden from them. Exactly. Yeah. I, can, I, can, I can attest to that just even, you know, for the for the video that we did, you know, I, right. I had no idea, you know, so. It Me was, either. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take one of your tours and I thought I knew a lot. We, we got to. <laughs> we but, have to. Yeah. Matter of fact, it should be mandatory in all DPS schools. I agree. I agree with Do that. Do a field trip. Like, right. seriously, Here because... Because really, if you talk about the history of Detroit, you're really talking about black history, period. That's right. That's right. Because Detroit is a different type of black. Because this right. is where most of the blacks landed mm-hmm. after the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. So right. we really, like, black culture, many, most, a lot of it came from here. That's right. It's, it's very Detroit specific, even though a lot of people might not realize mm-hmm. that little, whatever that little swag or whatever mm-hmm. it might be, like they might not know the route, but That's right. it probably still came from here. That's so right. I think it's dope. Yeah, everybody needs to take them tours. Everybody. That's right, and this this is where where yeah. basically they make black people in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Sydney, can can you recall maybe like a, um? And I, I know you you got numerous pieces, a variety of murals. Can you recall maybe? a most memorable time of, of painting a mural or, you know, just. It got to be right now. Like I just, the one I just did. I yeah. can't, you can't get more memorable, memorable than that. That's right. Like, I mean, you can, right. and I'm about to, but for right now, <laughs> <laughs> that's my most memorable. And I, I recently um, just painted a Malice Green tribute mural, but it wasn't, Malice Green specific. Um, it was stem for them, um, of course, all of these terrible things that have continuously been happening to black people. I don't know, the last 400 or so years, who's counting? But in the last 40 days, it's been off the chain, right? Damn near hunting season on black people. So after George Floyd's murder um, at the hands of police, um, uh, she goes by Asada Shakur on Facebook, but I found out after I painted the mural, her real name is Takara. This woman that went to Cass Tech, she's a little younger than me, because I'm Cass Tech graduate 97, um, posted an article about Malice Green in an effort to educate people who didn't know that he existed, that he was even a thing. So I clicked on this link, I read the article, and of course they spoke about Kim Worthy and all of her efforts in getting convictions for the cops that murdered him. They literally beat the man to death. Um, and that was back in 1992, That's right. which is why. And the history um, of the case is not just the murder. It was the justice, but it was also this mural um, painted by Benny White Jr., the original mural. He painted it at the site where Malice was murdered. Um, at the end of the article, it brings up the mural and it talks about Benny White Jr., and it talks about how the com- although the community wanted the mural to be preserved, because it was small, it was on like a party store. They demolished um, the property and they destroyed the mural as well. So that kind of floored me, like, like it crushed my spirit. And I, I think I decided in that moment, it wasn't a, 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 a full decision at the time. It's like, damn, I don't even paint men. Because I don't, I don't paint black, I don't paint anybody but black women right now mm-hmm. in my body of art, in my larger body of work. But I was like, I think I'm gonna have to paint this Malice Green mural. Mm-hmm. But I didn't want to just paint Malice Green because, after all, it's not about Malice Green, it's about all of the Malice Green. And so, what I designed was Malice Green holding a scroll, and the scroll contains, in my brain at the time of design, all of the names, mm-hmm. right? 
that have been uh, people that have been murdered at the hands of police just since my birth year, 1979. I thought I was going to cover 1979 to 2020. Mm, that's too many. So <laughs> my, the reason why it's memorable is not just because of what I painted. It was how I got it done. The mural is massive. It's 3,500 square feet. Like, for me to just be able to do it, I needed a lot of help financially just mm. because paint costs money. Um, I'm part owner of the building along with uh, Rayshard Tucker. It's the Tucker Hamilton Gallery, the Hamilton Tucker Galleries, along with Breanne White. So I went to them like, hey, I'm thinking about p painting this mural, blah, 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 blah. Put it online. Just Facebooks too, not even Instagram. Mm. And just the thought like got like 700 800 likes but when i actually put the gofundme out the next day that's the memorable part mm. i i put up a gofundme for ten thousand dollars it was going to cover me giving a small stipend to my assistants all of the paint which is extremely expensive it's a large building so i need a real big girl equipment the boom lifts the scissor lifts and i got a team because i want to also get it done quickly ten thousand dollars was raised in 2.5 hours. Wow, wow. I literally went to work out in my backyard. I posted mm. the link, went to work out in my backyard, came back in to $5,000. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Shower, put on some different clothes, chill mm. out, watch Judge Miller Young, let's see where this goes. Right. No, two and a half hours, it was fully funded. I was almost double the next day and then I shut the, um, the donations off. But it was it, it's been accepted very widely. Like people just find it by accident, and of course, if anybody's connected to me, they find it. But also newspapers and the news and stuff. So sure. if it wasn't memorable for me, it was gonna be, be memorable for whoever still gets the Sunday paper. So Absolutely. it's dope. It's dope. And the the oh, and going back to the names. Um, my original plan was 40 years worth. What's up there is over a thousand names and it's only about three years worth yeah. and not consecutive. <laughs> like, cause there is no one database to find all of this information. Right. So like they don't, cause if it really was in one place, it would look like Britannica. Mm -hmm. the, you know the, the encyclopedias mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and um yeah but we we got it done and it's memorable all right it's n not necessarily a good memory all good memories you know what i mean but it's powerful i know that yeah so, so that's the thing you 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 were, you kept it going you continued that legacy you immortalized it and those people and those names again and I commend you for that. Like, and that's the thing about artists. You know, a lot of times we feel compelled. You know what I mean to to immortalize our people or or the, these right. stories that we feel passionate about. Um, and then the funny it's thing, it's our duty. I, I agree, and not all of us feel like that, but I, I agree one hundred percent. Like, oh yeah, it's not, and it's okay to not feel like that. Uh, you know right. what I mean? That's true. Uh, but black people, unfortunately. We, we are burdened with telling our own truths. Look right. what happens when other people tell our truths. That's Who right. Who else going to do it? That's right. Yeah. And that's the so thing. So we got to do it. So when, when, when we talk about, I guess, memorable times, and, and again, I'm, I'm usually behind the camera. Um, so uh, I have a series called Maestro, and it's about black artists in the city of Detroit. Um, and so, uh, very fitting, my most memorable interview is with you, though, Sydney. Like, no, 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 no. So, so you were my second interview, and, and it's, it's weird because, okay, I, I sold somebody on the first uh, interview, which the Glam Tech, Christina the Glam Tech. Mm -hmm. When I came to you, you agreed without seeing any footage. And that was the thing I was trying. It was like my baby. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to keep it swaddled. And I don't want you to see it. But just trust me that it's going to be nice. And Sydney let me in her home. And i never forget, like, the first thing you said. He was like, uh, is your name really Cartier? I'm like, yeah, that's my real name. He was like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I'm like, okay. 
Now I know it's going to be a good interview. So, <laughs> so I, I, I just appreciate that. You let me in your home. And it and just gave me what I needed as a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Thank so you. That was most, most definitely memorable. And you're one of my favorite people after that. So kudos to you. Um, Thank you, friend. That's indeed, still indeed. funny that your mama named you after the stunner right. glasses. Yeah, right. but, but look, the big Gretch. <laughs> Specials. Yeah, seven, but, but then it wasn't the glasses. Cartier was just a jeweler. Mm. And right. She like said that. I was her, her black jewel. And oh, wow. Was, yeah. Right. So it was like, Aww. you know, we're going to get a little sick. <laughs> but I digress. Now, big Gretch wearing your ass right there on her face now. All right. What's going on? Rest in peace. <laughs> so, um, what, what I do kind of want to want to ask Jamon also is uh, you, you, you talk about the, these tours in the city of Detroit most of what you talk about and in, in the, the stories that you tell, we've been there for years, our families have been here for years, and we have no clue as to what happened, how it happened, and, and who was involved. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you even, again, told one on the, uh, on, on the video that, that I put out, um, but do you have a, a, a certain Detroit story that you feel like all of us should know? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so the Detroit Black community, is founded on freedom. So forget what you heard. It ain't about um, the murder capital. It ain't about the uh, devil's night. It ain't about drugs or crack. It ain't about none of that. Detroit's black community is founded on a fight for freedom. So that's the first important thing you ought to know, that black people organized themselves in the city of Detroit. They were living here. Now, let, let's be clear. There are black folks living here. But they didn't become a community until they organized themselves around fighting for freedom. So that's the first part. The second part of that is two black women are the founders of the city of Detroit. So there's never been, I just want you to really understand something, that when it comes to black history, when it comes to black people making progress, there's never been a time period where black people made progress and women weren't at the forefront of that progress. And oh, Y'all wouldn't Detroit. make it without us. We know That's that. Right. Women know that. We know That's that. right. Women all know that. Y'all don't know that. Now, a lot of times when we know. talk about history, we talk about it more in a more patriarchal way than it actually oh, happened. Yeah. When the stuff happened, women was doing stuff. When we tell it, men did it all. That's the way we tell history. And so I have to consciously, because I'm a product of the misteaching of history. So I'm a product of that. And so to correct that, one of the things I did to correct the way we tell history is to um, talk about Black people's history, which is, of course, was missing when I was growing up. The other part of that, even when I got better on that, was missing out on Black women's role and contributions to history. So I have, I, that's something I still have to purposefully, I have to intentionally make sure that I mm -hmm. focus and center Black women, because if you're talking about Black history and you're not talking about Black women, you're really not talking about Black history. Right. In the city of Detroit, two women, you need to know their names, Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot. Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot. So I'm, I've heard Tabitha. of Tabitha Lightfoot. Yeah, you need to know these two women's names because these two women are leaders in a plan to free two black people, a black man and woman who were married, Thornton and Rutha Blackburn. Rutha changed her name to Lucy once she got free. So Thornton and Lucy Blackburn got captured by slave catchers, bounty hunters, right here in the city of Detroit. They were put in a jail on Gratiot and Farmer. There was always a jail on Gratiot. So the jail used to be on Gratiot and Farmer, right behind where the old Hudson's building was, yeah. right behind where the Copyware building is now. The Skillman Public Library sits there now. There used to be a jail sitting there. And this black man, Thornton, and his wife, Lucy, were in jail there being held by the sheriff, the deputy, and slave catchers who were going to take them back down south. Two women were leaders of the plan to free them. Part of the plan was they went down to visit Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn on Sunday, June 16, 1833, and nobody was allowed to see Thornton. So Thornton wasn't allowed visitors, but they go in to see Ruth because she is allowed visitors. So they in the jail cell with her 
And Caroline French, while in the jail cell with Ruth of Blackburn, switches clothes with Ruth of Blackburn inside of the jail cell. All right, so just like um, facial recognition, think we all look alike. Well, back then, the sheriff and deputy and the slave catchers thought these black women all looked alike. And so Tabitha Lightfoot leaves visiting time with Ruth of Blackburn wearing Caroline French's clothes. They walk right by the sheriff and deputy, get her on a boat, get her over to Canada so she can be free. The next morning, Caroline French tells them who she is. I'm Caroline French. Y'all better let me go. I'm free. The woman that y'all thought y'all had is going to Canada because we switched clothes and y'all ain't even know. So let me go. Now, bounty hunters only make money for bringing people back. So they like, well, if you switch, well, you really going to switch and we're going to take you back with, we're going to take you back and sell you. And Caroline French said, I'm from Detroit. Plus, I'm from the east side. So <laughs> 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 they don't want no problem. They don't want, you don't want no smoke. Yeah. So when they walk out of the jail, it's 400 people outside with bricks, sticks, knives, swords, guns, two by fours, poles. And the sheriff will get killed that night. He will not make it. Um, the, the deputy and the two slave catchers going to have to fend for their own lives. But in the midst of that, Thornton is going to get free, taken over to Canada, reunited with his wife, and they both going to get free. And out of this group of people who freed Thornton and Ruth the Blackburn, you now have a core group of people who are going to be the first institution builders in the city of Detroit, the first black school. This, them, that's the same group of people. The first black church in the state of Michigan, Second Baptist, same people. The, oh, yeah. the black businesses that come out and become begin to organize themselves. The first black mutual aid organization that are helping other black folk who can't help themselves. The Underground Railroad gets organized by these same people who freed Thornton and Ruth and Blackburn. Now, it ain't just black people living in the city of Detroit. You have a community with community institutions. And these two black women are founders of the black Detroit. And we don't know their names. We ought to know their names. Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot. Caroline who? French. French. Tabitha what? Lightfoot. Lightfoot. Remember those names. Sydney, uh, I know you so so knowing that we can hang up now. He just dropped the I, mic on the whole I, shit. I'm done. <laughs> but but I would like to put in a request uh for a mural of Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot. So somewhere we don't know what they look like. So we don't we don't have any Yeah, we don't have any photographs of them as of now. They, right. they may have lived long enough to be photographed. Well, we know they lived long enough to be photographed. They lived at right. the time when photographs were being done, but we have yet to find a photograph. We believe that one day we're going to find one of, the, of Lightfoot because the Lightfoot mm. family, really, they had a long history in the city of Detroit in the area. Okay. So we believe okay. we might one day get a Lightfoot picture. French might be more difficult. Okay. Indeed. That's... that's See, that I'm just... But I still could do a piece and honor that story, though. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, that, that's right. dope. Like, right. it's, I'm, I couldn't be more happy that I selected y'all for this. <laughs> and I'm just, I'm just in awe. I'm sitting back learning and taking notes um, as if I'm, you know, just watching. So, uh, and that's a beautiful thing. So... Um, Sydney, is there anything you would like to add on that? Like, I know. No. Right? <laughs> exactly. I'm like asking for a follow up comment in class after somebody already gave all of the right answers. Yeah, no? we, we, we can ring the bell on that one. Um, right. <laughs> it's lunchtime. Shit. Pretty Go. much. Recess. So, I know a lot of times, um, and, and we did talk about that, uh, and, and we I just kind of want to touch on it a little more. Um, because I think all of us, at least, we do feel compelled or obligated to share our stories. Because I, I think once it's realized that we have a gift in a certain area, what 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 good is it if you don't use it to help the disenfranchised? The, uh, like I try, I like to say, we people who are darker than blue, like Curtis Mayfield said. So. Um, can we just talk about how, how we do feel compelled or and, and even as, as Sydney has said, sometimes burdened to tell our stories because who else is going to do it? Oh, it's a burden. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 
you get pleasure out of it because creating the act of creating, you know, gives you that type of runner's euphoria once you get in your groove. Right. You know what I mean? Um, what was the question? Like, what was the feeling about telling the stories? Or, or just talk about how how you either feel compelled or or burdened, and, and just kind of how it's how not. So I'm more. I am more con- compelled than burdened. Mm-hmm. Like the malice green piece was a burden. I'm sure. That was a thought, which is why I had so much help, right. and even more help that I didn't init- that I didn't um, count on in the beginning. Like my other art friends, like Sabrina Nelson, Halima Cassells, Ibrahima, um, they came out like, "Hey, we'll we'll take on some of these names." Because right. it's one thing to have an idea, but once you start getting into it, I was like, "Oh shit! Right. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I have to have this idea?" Right. But it was necessary. Like it needs to be. Like it was. It's definitely a story that needs to be told. But other stories, how I tell my stories, might not look like the story that it really is. For instance, um, a few years back, and I'm still working on it. I I started a series called Appropriated Not Appreciated, speaking on the existence of Black women in this country specifically, but really around the world. Mm-hmm. Appropriated. You want black girl attributes, all of this ass, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want girl, black girl problems. You just don't. You don't want to be the, the, the girl snatched up and nobody looks for. You don't want to be that name. You don't want to be the girl that may have gotten raped, but you got to keep quiet about that shit. You don't want to be that girl. So you don't want black girl problems. You don't want to be the girl that got tossed up passed up for a job because you're a black woman and this there's either a black man that's tall or a white woman that or anybody else but you you don't want to be that person you don't want to have to fight like i've literally been in a room my first job advertising i was 22 and i worked for the devil i did i seen that nigga he gone now some he did but he was literally, he sat me and my male counterpart down, like, oh my God, you and this guy have been doing such a great job. I'm going to give you both raises. Because I was like a startup at the co- company, but I worked my ass off. He said, Sydney, I'm going I'm to I'm bump you up to 45000 And the other person, you're going to get 55000 And I'm going to get both of y'all $5,000 signing bonuses. And neither one of them niggas flinched. <laughs> I didn't even know if I even discussed it with dude after. Like, y'all, like, nobody had a pro- I had an internal problem, but I couldn't say anything. I think I was started, I, was, I started at like 27 or some shit. So I was still 20 more than I was making, but I was also 10 behind. So the, the series started because, you know, after Trayvon, it was Mike Brown and all of these other men. However, there are Ayanas, there are Brianna's, there was a Sandra Bland, there was a young lady down at a Texas pool party, and this was really the catalyst. The Texas pool party, where the Karen called the police on the kids, because of course black kids that. couldn't possibly afford to be able to live and swim here in these pools. Mm-hmm. It's only 20, 20 whatever teen it is. Mm. Can't possibly afford to be over here in be- these pools. Well, mm. I watched the video late at night of this cop putting his knee in this girl's back and pulling on her braids. I remember that. Mm. And what bothered me most, because it, w- of course, that bothered me. But what bothered me most is all the people standing around, including mm. the black man. Mm. Watching this shit happen and nobody said nothing. The only person who tried to take up for that baby was a black boy that got chased by another cop with a fucking gun. Mm-hmm. So, to, you know, introduce my series to the world, I painted myself nude on a big piece of vinyl and I laid it at the entry point of the gallery. At, the first time I in- introduced it, it was at Cass Cafe. And it's a beautiful painting, but it was on the floor. Because I, at that moment, I just said, okay, we the real doormats. We the doormats of the doormats. Because nobody gives a fuck. Like, 
that's where the say her name movement, you know, had started to, it had to become a thing. You know what I'm saying? Because it's crazy. The Black Lives Matter movement was also started by women, but we really still only talk about the fatalities of the men. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about the trans that have been killed, and they won't even investigate those crimes. We don't talk about shit else. And it ain't not, it's not, and I don't have a problem with us talking about y'all. We need to talk about y'all too, but we need to talk about the whole gambit. That's right. And we need to treat the whole gambit like everybody is equally affected. You know that's what I right. mean? That's right. So that's why I made the conscious decision to only paint black women because mm -hmm. I'm not painting in a position of like fetishizing us. Because a, a lot of people paint black women, mm -hmm. I, they do. But then why are you painting us? Are you painting us as subjects? As fetishes? Mm -hmm. What are you painting it? Because when mm -hmm. I ain't paint, not that you have to paint every art artist is to have to be equal with their intent. That's, That's not right. what I'm saying. Right. I am saying I know my intent. And mm -hmm. this is why it's important for us to tell our own stories. That's right. So while I grew from like the negative portrayal of how I feel people treat us, how I know people treat us, mm -hmm. I've been treated. I just started painting us in a more beautiful light, how we really are. And mm -hmm. even when I paint us in that beautiful light, I paint all of the landscapes. Like you're going to see every crevice. It's beautiful, the mm -hmm. lines, all, but you're going to see it and, it's, and you're going to feel a little different. It's not, I, I feel like when people look at my work, they don't really feel like they're looking at a painting per se. So I, I feel like they... I feel like they're feeling the painting or something. Because everybody always trying to tell me, oh, this looks just like my wife. No, it doesn't, though. Let me see a picture of your wife. Mm -hmm. No, it don't. Mm -hmm. I was like, Sydney, stop doing that shit because it probably feels like his wife. Mm -hmm. And that's better than it looking like even whoever you painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. So, and, and that's, again, like you say, just, just, painting our people in that light. And <clears throat> I feel like even with what I do, that's what I try to do. So, so the mm -hmm. idea just behind the Maestro series is putting black faces with classical music because mm -hmm. it's my thought that a lot of times when we hear classical music, we automatically think sophistication. Mm -hmm. You know, we automatically think high class. Mm -hmm. um, so- That's I, the marketing. It, it, exactly. So, so my thing is like, I want to put these beautiful images of us to this type of music. And, and it's kind of like the medicine and the candy where it's like, now look at us. That's yep. who we are. That's Let me calm your ass down first. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like we love rap. We love our rap. And we love all that. Right. So many messages yep. to us. But take a look at this for a second. And, and also, Jamon, you know, uh, let's let's get you with the same question. Do you? I'm sure to some extent you feel compelled to to tell our stories. You are a Black Studies major, so mm -hmm. can you elaborate on that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, definitely. Um, one of the things I I was a teacher. So let's start there. I was a teacher. I taught children. Um, Come on, Black man. <laughs> hey. So yeah. So I was a teacher. I taught. I, I was a. I taught K through 12 for almost 20 years. Half of that time, 10 of those years was just middle school. So most of the time that I taught as a teacher, I taught middle school social studies. I still consider myself at heart a middle school social studies teacher. So when I'm doing my tours and when I'm talking, I'm really talking as if I'm talking to my middle school class. And it just seems to work out. You know, I'm, I'm really kind of still a middle school teacher at heart. But I, te I taught middle school social studies and I felt that what I was doing first, when I first became a teacher and black history was missing, I felt that even though I was doing my best to put it in my class, I felt to teach my students all that other stuff that they were trying to get them to learn without teaching them black history was a crime. I felt that yeah. I, I, and I felt like I was a, 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 a co-conspirator in the crime if I continued to teach that way. Mm -hmm. So that's how I first thought. And then as I began to, um, add in as much black history as I possibly could, 
no matter what the the uh, the curriculum said to do, then I, I felt better. And then, of course, eventually I began working at an African center school, Instaroma Institute Public School Academy, for 10 years. When I worked there, of course, Black history is the foundation of the school, so I didn't have to worry about that issue. But then I got these students in the city of Detroit, and they knew, you know, because they got Black history at Instaroma, and so they knew about Martin Luther King Jr. They knew about Malcolm X. They knew about the Black Panther Party. They knew about Rosa Parks. They knew about all these people, but they knew about them in other places. So they knew about Martin Luther King Jr. in Montgomery and in Selma and in Birmingham. They knew about Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat in Montgomery, Alabama. They knew about Malcolm X in New York, uh, Temple Number 7. They knew about the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. But what they didn't know was Detroit's Black history. They didn't even know that Rosa Parks lived in the city of Detroit longer than she lived in Montgomery and that she was an activist here just as much as she was an activist in Montgomery, Alabama. They didn't know Detroit had a branch of the Black Panther Party. They didn't know that the Nation of Islam was following the city of Detroit. So a number of students um, at all the schools I've taught had to be able to go and see these sites to learn this history. And so I thought that was also a crime to teach students about all these other places, but they live in Detroit and they don't know Detroit. Well, that's a problem too. And so I, that's a crime to be teaching them about Oakland. Is That's important. Montgomery, that's important. Birmingham, Harriet Tubman on the East Coast as a leader of the Underground Railroad, but they don't know about Thorn and Ruth of Blackburn and Caroline French and Tabitha Lightfoot here in the city of Detroit. That's a crime too. They ought to know that, they, that where they are is a historic site and is a foundation for a whole bunch of other Black history throughout the country. And so, yeah, I the feel compelled. I feel compelled to do this. So yeah, I have to do what I do. And I was doing That's it. That's probably why your tours are so great too, because you do speak with enthusiasm like you're talking right. to children. Right. I yeah, feel like all it. teachers yeah, probably should keep it. that. Yeah, maybe that, that, that's know. probably is it, yeah. Yep. And, and that's I, so dope. That. Like even, even with the video we, we just released, it was just like, as soon as you started talking this, and people have said it, like you just listen up. It's like, Okay, teach me then, you know, and and that's that's just that's a gift. And um, I still remember their names. Tabitha Lightfoot. That's hey, right. that's right. And we got Caroline French. Caroline French. <laughs> that's right. So and, and what I'd like to do real quick before we uh kind of hop into the meat and potatoes of, of of what we're here for today, and that's talking about how we profit. Um uh, I just kind of want to read a couple of the chats while we were talking. Uh, Elizabeth Whitaker Walker says, "So grateful, oh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, so grateful for the ways all of you lift and protect our historical narrative." Uh, we got Amen. Uh, Denitra Gregory said, "That's right, Sydney." Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth Walker also said, "Teach." Uh, we got Crystal King who said, "I love this honest conversation with a heart." Um, Elizabeth Whitaker Walker again said, you all are delivering a whole word. We got Siobhan Henderson, so true about the overt absence of black women as it pertains to Black Lives Matter, as if our feminine parts make us impervious to maltreatment. Um, and then Shannon Kaysen uh, said, an important panel. So, you know, we, we, making, we making some impact, y'all. So... Mm -hmm. That's great to know. And we appreciate you guys for the comments in the chat. Um, so I guess where, where we can kind of jump off into is how we kind of turned our first profit and, and a bit of the, the process after that, you know, um, because I, we all do it because we love to do it. Uh, and, and I'm sure if all jobs paid the same, we would still be doing what we do. Uh, but uh, let's start with you, Sydney. Can you remember where you kind of turned your first profit and said, okay, I can, you know, let's, let's take this angle. So I've been an entrepreneur now for, I think I'm coming up on 10 years, but I, it wasn't mural painting I started with. I was actually hand painting clothes. I've always been an artist though. Um, started off illustration, art direction. I was a ghost artist for Lincoln Heights and a couple of other shows. So I've always had like an art career. Now I just jump into the mural painting. Mm -hmm. So I initially started doing street art by taking over vacant lots in my neighborhood and I erected art from the ground. Cause 
my friend Kalima Cass- Cassells moved back from Brooklyn and she started taking over lots in her neighborhood, but she was like uh, starting urban farms and shit like that. I wasn't doing that. And because um, I have no interest in planting things. Um, so we wrecked the art from the ground. We got like abandoned doors and I recruited Christopher Batten and a couple other artists, Lamar Landers, Sabrina did it. Did one, I think Singor did the revamp of it. Like we had, we made it a thing. And then I later got invited to do the same thing in Grand River Creative Corridor um, with Derek Weaver and artist Syntex, the graffiti artist. Syntex was curating like the graffiti portion, like in getting all of those artists assembly, uh, assembled to take over the street. And Derek wanted like a more fine art approach, like with the structures I had built in my neighborhood. But after working on that project um, for like a year, like it didn't take long to, it didn't take a year to do the project, but just being related to the, shown closely related to the project, Derek offered me up a, a wall in 2014. He's like, hey, you want to paint a wall? Fuck it. I think I can paint on anything I want to. So I painted on the wall. Right. The very next year, Murals in the Market was coming. Um, was coming to, um, to town. Now, here's a fun fact. A lot of people think that Murals in the Market was my first mural or my first major mural. That's not true. I painted my first major mural in LA two weeks prior because I got paid for that one. Okay. <laughs> a friend of mine is like, an inter- she is an interior designer and she was doing this space. It was called this business called Kitty City. And I'm saying this because this is the business portion. It's, a, um, it's an internal mural that I've done, and it's large. It was beautiful with kids and, like, whole city street. And I came off of that, flew back home, and then two weeks later, murals in the market came. And, and at that time, I still wasn't a muralist. I was just an artist that could paint murals. Mm-hmm. I did my, my first mural for murals in the market. I mimicked the Vibe magazine cover of Death Row with Suge Knight, Dr. Dre, Tupac, what was it, Snoop? Did I miss Snoop? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I painted myself, Tiff Massey, Tylon Sawyer, and Rashawn Rucker on a wall in Eastern Market. And that wall, that festival was so successful, especially like the first year, because it was 25 out-of-state artists out of country, 25 local artists. And it was really like all love, like the best seven days of art school packed into one week. Like it was really, really dope. I want to say a month after Murals in the Market, um, because this is when I saw the value of like, because Murals in the Market is not a paid gig. It's just, it's a festival, right? But they have a lot of PR and PR is indeed currency. So write that down, kids. Mm -hmm. PR is currency. Um, My mural was listed as one of the top 18 murals in Detroit. And I got contacted by a mural production company out in New York that was doing it, had like a job here for like Fresh Empire. And I got my first commercial gig like literally a month. I didn't paint it until the following year because, you know, going into the winter months. But yeah, I got my first commercial gig like a month after um, Murals in the Market and I haven't stopped since. So, um, and I haven't actually had to solicit work either like it kind of, it comes to me but i feel like it's with any type of entrepreneurship if it lacks passion it might not make that much money that's right that's right i think that's what the three of us have in common and what many of my friends circle who are entrepreneurs time you'll make the money because it'll come to you because everybody else can see oh you mean what you do mm-hmm. yeah. You got to have a solid product. That's number one. Don't do ugly shit or don't put out like half ass shit. Uh-huh. Uh, but then also know your worth and, and be willing to charge your worth. And it's okay to say no. But if you're a beginner entrepreneur, be wary of your nose. You know what I'm saying? Like really, and that's the real currency you want to earn up to, the power to say no. Mm-hmm and to turn down stuff that you don't want to do. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, that's when I, when I started. Um, and the thing about money is you make enough money so you really can do whatever you want. That's the key. <laughs> so if I make a good amount from doing two walls in a year, 
I can do all the mural festivals I feel like for the rest of the year because they ain't going to pay and I get to have fun and hang out with all my art friends. Right, right. Well, now, now, and real quick, would you, would you say that that first commercial job, did that set the standard for your pricing after that? Was it like, yes. okay, okay, all right. <laughs> right? So, like, how this is what I get paid, right? Yes, because then, okay, so this, if, you're, if any artists are joining us, you have to consider like the design is one fee. It can be broken down a lot of different ways. Your design is one fee. Um, Cause some artists have murals, but didn't necessarily paint their own murals. Cause some people just design artists, design a mural, a wall, but they'll hire like the company who commissioned the artist will hire a mural painting company to paint the mural. Just like Amy Sherrill, she just had that big ass wall done. She didn't touch that wall though. Mm. I enjoy the art of painting the murals. I enjoy that part of the work. Right. Like, I like being able to challenge my body in such a way. You know what I mean? I like being, I feel like I'm a Ruby the Riveter, you know, when I'm handling them big ass booms right. and boom lifts and people walking up like, you knew that all by yourself? <laughs> yes. So, ball shit. Right. That's how I be feeling. Like, <laughs> ball shit. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. <laughs> like, but you know, take a, and then take account. Like, and each job should teach you a lesson. If you didn't learn your lesson, you didn't fully get paid. Because you take your lesson to the next job to make the easier. You know, your process easier. That's a that's the whole word. If you didn't learn a lesson, you didn't fully get paid. No, you miss up. Uh, so, and, and, and Jamon, uh, same question about turning your first profit and, and where you saw like, okay, this can be a thing and kind of how did you structure things after that? Yeah, so I have to say that at first, I, I kind of did this like a hobby. You know, I loved history. I, I thought people ought to know this stuff and money kind of was an afterthought. I was a historian posing as a business person. So, you know, I didn't know nothing about business. I, you know, I charge this, you know, and if they didn't have it, well, give me what you got. You know, if it, if some people would do a tour. And say, oh, I got this $2. Uh, okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Come on, do the tour. Let's do the tour. I ain't going to stop you. And so that's how it kind of started. So that was one thing I began doing because my passion out was had surpassed my business sense. So I was more passionate about teaching history than I cared about actually making this a uh, uh, an effective business. So that was the first issue. Then this other issue was when I would have certain groups like social justice organizations and, and activists would take tours and I'd give them one tour. And then when universities and schools would do a tour, I would give them a, a more uh, sanitized version of the tour. And what I found, I, I, I started feeling bad about that. A, a year, two years in, I'm like, I, I ain't giving... They missing some stuff. They they need to know this too. Not just the activists. Mm -hmm. need to know this. These institutions, these professors, these university folks, they need to know it too. So I began giving them the real tour. You know, I began giving them, and and they liked the real better than the the nice where I didn't you know make too many critical comments about the the white community's history. You know, they they didn't want that. They didn't pick me to do the tour for that. There's other people who do those tours. Right. They picked me because they thought they were going to get the real, and then I gave them the sanitized version, so that messed me up. So then an institution, I will, I will, they will remain nameless, but there's an institution that um, I began doing the real tours, and I began to also think more about business. You know, I, I still wasn't a business person, but thinking more about that and how I need to make this a viable business, and I began doing tours inside of that institution. Because what I saw, that institution, their own tours that they were giving um, were, was missing black history. So your institution, you got black history there, but you ain't talking about it. And so I began to do my own tours there. And they sent me a cease and desist. Get out of Don't come to our place. Don't do no tours here. Stop it immediately. Um, and so it was a real beef between me and that institution. And then a, um, a, um, a school group went into that school, I mean, that institution and did a tour. It was all black kids, black parents was there. 
and the black parents bl blasted the place on Facebook. There was mm -hmm. lists and lists of how bad the tour was, how no black history was, was taught and what little black history was taught was taught in a demeaning fashion and it was just horrible. And the institution really um, suffered over this um, uh, attack on them. Well, this, this, this rating of them, um, this reading of them by this black mama right. who went on this tour with her child, with these students. I was called by the institution. And the institution said, I know what we said. Huh. We'd like to bring you in. First, we want you to start doing tours in our institution again. Please come to our institution and do tours here again. Right. And right. second, we will pay you to train our staff on doing tours that include Black history. You will train our whole staff. And so I did. I trained their whole staff on um, how to do tours and include black history in your institution that has black history all over it, but y'all don't know how to do it. And I began to do tours and they're one of my very important partners to this day. Uh, and so changing, moving away from trying to do a sanitized version for white institutions, that changed my business and it actually boosted my business. And um, given the real and forcing institutions to have to work with me. Um, if you're doing something about black history in the city of Detroit, there's very few institutions that are doing anything about black history in the city of Detroit that don't try to reach out to me. And so um, that is been my being able to be a partner with other institutions who have a bigger reach than me and that, and also being real when I do my tours and rather than trying to do something that I think they might want to, might be more amenable to them. No, no, you gotta be, you gotta be real. You gotta do it the way it ought to be done. Black history has to be taught the way it really is, not uh, a way that's going to be more comfortable for white patrons. Right. And that, that's um, like you talked about, you, you, in a way you start to force people to work with you. When you have that, when you have the passion for what you do and, and you work really hard at, at your craft, it's only a matter of time before they come to you. And I'll talk really briefly kind of, um, cause I know we're a little pressed for time now, um, just about how I started to kind of turn my profit. Um, when I would do these interviews, I, I started my first series was, was called Entrepreneur. So here we are right here. Of course, a play on words for black entrepreneur. And my whole thought process was, again, I wanted the, the business owner to have just a short interview about who they were. So I wanted to change the way that businesses marketed to, to the patron, to, to the patrons. So rather than I'm so-and-so, this is my product or this is the service that I provide, it should be, this is my story and this is how I got to providing this service or got to yeah. selling this product because people don't usually buy your product or service. They buy you. And, and I just, I, I wanted people to tell their story. So it became, okay, I'm doing these interviews. All of them were for free. So don't sleep on free work people. Um, and, and it, it's what it advertising. Became, it, exactly. So, so it became that. And it, and it was like, okay, well, this guy, he came and he did this interview for free and the work is, it started to get to a point where it was better than what people would pay for. Mm -hmm. So now when it's time to circle back and your business needs some marketing or you need a video for your business or you need to advertise a new product or service, I was the first person that people thought about. And, and in a way, maybe sometimes they felt a little indebted to me because I, I did that free series or that interview and a lot of people got news interviews after, you know, me, me working with them and things like that. So I didn't get into it for that, but it was just like I started to get better at the craft and things of that nature. And then certain people would come along a little later like, oh, I know you charge. So what do you charge? Mm -hmm. And I kind of took that and, and ran with it. I was timid at charging three hundred dollars. I wouldn't dream of charging that now. Oh, I feel <laughs> but, you. I feel you one hundred percent. You see what I'm saying? But but, yeah. but we, we, we crawl before we walk. Right. And, right. Uh, you know. So yeah, and, and, and they got to pay us how we weigh. You know, black people need all three of us, 
in, in all of our capacities. You know, I can't wait to open up a brick and mortar and have Sydney paint a mural and mm. to give a tour right out front mm. about what it used to be. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's us. We're all storytellers at heart. Um, uh, now, I, I don't know if people are sending in questions right now, but we do have one from Sherry Cummins. Um, she says, or she asks, can you tell us how to use storytelling to increase our business profits, particularly restarting after COVID-19? Does anything hmm. come to mind immediately for you guys? Yeah, so um, what you have to do, you first you have to tell a story. So whatever the story is, uh, you have to do it. So that, that's the first step that you must accept the fact that you must be a storyteller, whatever your business is, particularly after COVID. So that's the first thing. The second thing is you have to tell a story that touches people, a, a story that is, is, is ingrained in the people. Um, when I talk about black history and, and I talk about the fact that black women are at the forefront of, of, of this history, well, black, that touches black women because they've been seeing the fact that black women are missing right now. They're, they're missing when people talk about Black Lives Matter. They're missing when people talk about black achievements and progress. They're missing. And they're like, okay, so this ain't new. This, this, you, people been doing this. And so that touches people. When we talk about um, this police incident and throwing the root to Blackburn, well, that touches people right now because... We got police issues right now. We, we've been having them. Since for 200 years in the city of Detroit, we've been having police issues. So that touches them. So you got to tell a story that touches something that's going on. You're not going to tell them about something that is just only something for you. That's not your storytelling. Your, that story, where even though it might be important to you, has some, some, some components in it that touches people where they are. So, you know, I ain't telling you the story about why my favorite color is beige, unless I can fuck up, <laughs> unless I can come out beige. of that, <laughs> unless I can come out of that yeah, and tell like you why <laughs> beige is important to everybody. Right. right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so no, Be no beige. Beige, no beige, right. beige lives matter. <laughs> yes. Uh -oh. <laughs> beige. <laughs> Um, we, okay. are, we are officially at the four o'clock hour. Oh. I know, I know. Um, yeah, this is, I, you, I wish, I'm glad actually that my microphone was muted because I was over here yelling at the screen the whole time. <laughs> um, just so much rich information, truth, um, just unabated truth. Um, what a beautiful discussion. Um, we're getting some comments in. Thank you. It was great. Excellent Thank you. discussion. Somebody's crying. Somebody Thank thinks so beige much. is stupid. It, no. I mean, just so <laughs> much good <laughs> stuff. No, I'm, jo I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, but thank you guys so much for just being here and sharing with us on that very real level that you, uh, that you naturally just share on. Uh, it has been a fantastic, excuse me, a fantastic discussion um, and super important. One of the good things about what we're doing here at Detroit Startup Week is that uh, these sessions are being recorded and they will be on the Detroit Startup Week YouTube page uh, once the uh, conference is over. So please go back and reference these sessions. I mean, this, I feel like I need to share this on Facebook just because of the current state of the world. Like, just listen to some Black people talk about Black people, okay? And the history mm -hmm. and the richness in a true in the true light. Um, uh, of greatness that we are, especially here in the city of Detroit. So thank you all for that. Thank you attendees for joining us. I am going to dismiss you all so that you can uh, join other sessions uh, later in the day. I hope you are enjoying your time with us here at Detroit Startup Week and I hope to see you all soon.